Um, so you, if anyone has any questions, I mean, it's up to the speaker whether you want to take the questions during the talk or at the end, but also you can post the questions in the chat and I will then read them out if you're too shy. All right, without further ado, Alexi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have some questions in, in, within the talk, just raise a hand, maybe I'll be able to schedule it. Okay. Uh, need to show if it's working. Yeah, it's working. Um, yeah, I am Alexei Rimpel, and I'm working uh, with uh, uh, Linux kernel team in Pingatronics. And uh, well, most of my topics uh, last uh, months are related to networking, so this probably not really actual anymore. Um, yeah. So I decided to preach about energy efficient internet is uh, broken. Um, every time I talk about this with anyone, they say, oh, I, I disabled it immediately because it's not working and everything is uh, not good enough. Uh, so I'm trying to fix at least things for me that it works uh, for my customers and it uh, is like a really deep rabbit hole. Uh, like there is no end to fixing things, uh, so is it even worth to work on this or not? In my case, uh, it was a medical device uh, which actually consumed not too much power, and uh, I measured that uh, inside of this medical device, uh, enabling uh, energy efficient Ethernet will like save 0.2 watts uh, per port. And so if you just count it per link, it will be too much, too much, uh, two times more. And if you have like switches and uh, a lot of this kind of infrastructure, it will count a bit more. So maybe it is worth to make it work and fix it uh, at one time. And uh, for medical devices, they are not always uh, enabled, uh, but uh, stay in standby mode and still need to be uh, activated uh, over network. And uh, it is actually cool if uh, this uh, device in the standby mode actually be able to consume less than one watt power um, in this mode. And to make it possible, then you need to en enable er energy efficient internet to actually reduce power consumption because there are no packets uh, transferred uh, in this mode and uh, link is mostly silent. So actually it's good to have it. Um, so I updated this uh, slide set. Uh, I was talking about this already previous here. Uh, there was more work to do. Now it's a bit less. Um, in current kernel, uh, there's already some patches included, which are a uh, rework of the Phi core um, framework uh, to uh, handle uh, most of um, advertisement for EE. To, to make EE work, we have different levels uh, which should be done. First of all is uh, uh, authentication ad advertisements so that uh, first uh, one site advertise like uh, I support this kind of uh, speed uh, link modes and uh, to these link modes we have uh, EE modes which should be used if we advertise them and the other side advertise them and we use exactly this link speed with which should overlap with a advertised link mode, something like this. <laughs> um, and before uh, the Phi core work, um, most of drivers was using own logic, and it was not really good because uh, sometimes uh, this logic was applied like on the system start and not on the actually link advertisement uh, uh, part. So uh, the EA actually failed or was never enabled or enabled but not used or used enforced and broke uh, configuration for other people uh, so there was different kind of broken variants um, to make the, to fix this, this you'll uh, need to 
use of oscilloscope. But you uh, don't need uh, to have any kind of uh, heavy duty, expensive oscilloscopes, just, uh, I don't know, in the budget level of 1,000 euro. Uh, it is enough to measure the link, and you'll see if this uh, mode is activated or not. I will, see, uh, I will show you some pictures how this can be done. Uh, so the target of my talk is uh, hope to inspire you to uh, take a look if maybe your devices are kind of affected because uh, there are different uh, hardware variants and I'm not able to fix it all or test it all. Um, so hopefully you can reuse this knowledge. Uh, I tried to analyze uh, the current state of drivers uh, which support or potentially support AE and uh, included uh, um, kernel version which should probably be okay. Um, but after I did this list, I noted that uh, probably they are still broken. So please recheck it again <laughs> if it's really working. <laughs> Uh, so my point was by uh, analyzing this uh, driver so that driver is actually um, activate this configuration, the energy efficient configuration, um, and the link up or link adjust state. And the green ones, they are doing this. Um, the FEC, the Freescale FEC was a bit complicated uh, case because it was broken in different uh, stages. Uh, now it is adjusting this low power configuration on the link up, but there's still timer configuration issues. I will talk about this a bit later. So it is probably still broken. Uh, there's a bit more drivers. And uh, yeah, this. Uh, the microchip still seems to be broken, and uh, Samsung, it was an interesting uh, driver because it seems to implement uh, all of what other hardware is doing in hardware. This driver seems to implement some kind of software-based uh, low power management uh, in runtime. I mean, in really, really pair package time. Um, so this should be investigated, but uh, I can't do it because I don't have this hardware. So uh, how is it expected to work nowadays? Um, with current changes in the FI core, um, if the Mac driver is attaching the FI, um, it should call uh, FI support E. Uh, function to advertise the FI framework that uh, this Mac is able to work with this. Uh, so the FI framework will be able to decide and say, okay, uh, we can advertise now the energy efficient modes. Um, otherwise, if this function is not called now, then the FI framework will not advertise it, and this is good. So it's better not advertising it if it's not working anyway. Um, then, after the link is established, the FI framework will set um, the variable enable TX LPI. LPI is for low power idle to the true. So the MEG driver should use this variable to decide if, well, it should not just decide, it just should enable low power idle support. And yeah, well, this should be done in link up or adjust link function. Um, typical issues, uh, like I said, that uh, some drivers do not uh, call the adjustment or enablement for low power idle uh, on the link up. So it is somehow uh, affected by ETH tool configuration, that after link was configured, then ETH tool was able to enable it somehow or disable it. Um, exactly, yeah. One of 
problems which uh, currently not handled at all are the timers. There are different kind of timers inside of the standard uh, which affect in different levels. Some of them are affecting Mac driver, some of them are related to the Fi driver. And this one which are related to the Mac driver, uh, they do not recalculate the frequency which is supplied to the Mac to the actual time. So they just hope it will work and the actual time which will go out of this device will not apply to uh, expected result. And in some cases it will really break uh, actual standards so the link will fail. Um, and some drivers just do not call Phi support EE, which will tell the Phi framework to not enable EE at all. Now a bit about timers. Um, first of all, we need to understand how the standard is working. Um, we have here different parts. This, the, road, uh, the red one, is uh, actual data transfer. So we are transferring some frame. And the idle. This idle is not low power idle. So after transfer, we just keep in uh, clocking things over RGMI or MII or turn inter interfaces, and it is uh, still active on all levels. Like Mac is clocking, Phi is still up, and on the link uh, on, on the cable, you will see a lot of modulation and so on. Um, as soon as uh, low power idle will be active, we'll have first a transition. This is a transition part. So the, one, the first one is a slip. So we announced that we are about to switch from idle to low power idle. And there is a, a timing which should be kept correctly to make this transition correct, uh, go uh, correct. After this, on the cable, you will see complete idle. There will be nothing, just zero. Uh, and it's good, so we switched. Uh, power is off. And in this case, usually the Mac is able to disable clocking. There is uh, some special signaling on RGMI side uh, that is signaling that we are in low power idle mode. And uh, uh, there is a silent, uh, the Phi is able to go in a deeper uh, power state and there's a silence on the cable. And uh, in a uh, scheduled time period, we have um, this refresh spikes, they are green. And with these refresh spikes have defined time and it's better not to change this timing. So in most cases, uh, if it's broken, then it's broken on the Phi side and you probably need to contact uh, the Phi vendor to fix it somehow or to provide proper values for the Phi to make them work correctly. And after this, we have a very important part is the wake time. Uh, the wake goes uh, from the Mac. If the Mac has uh, a new frame to transfer, it will start uh, idle signaling on RGMI interface. And this idle signal, uh, or idle op operation code, uh, this is very important to give the time to wake up for the Phi and to let wake up the remote Phi and the remote Mac. If this time is not kept correctly, you will see frame corruptions. And sometimes if you see like, oh, A is broken because I have some kind of frame corruptions, this is the probably exactly this timer, which is not configured correctly. And in case of the FEC, Freescale FEC driver, this timer is configurable and it is not configured correctly. So most probably it is broken now.
Um, so what order of magnitude are these times? Are we talking about microseconds, tens of microseconds, or milliseconds, or? Yeah, this is microseconds. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I tried to um, assign uh, all of these timers to different components. So we have five timers. This is TS, T, Q, and T R. All of these timers: sleep, quiet, and refresh. Um, these timers are related to phi. So if they are broken somehow then probably you'll be able to measure this with the scope. Um, but most probably you should contact a chip vendor. And in this case, if they are broken, then uh, the changes and adjustments should go to the phi driver. Then we have MAC-related timers. This uh, transmit timer and wake timer. The wake timer is this one. And the transmit timer, which is configurable by the H tools, is this one. It's not really defined in the standard. It's like an optimization. For example, after frame is transmitted, we tell the Mac how long should it stay in not low power idle uh, to uh, to not reduce the speed too much. So. Uh, if you we'll immediately change uh, after each frame to the low power idle, uh, then we probably have some speed regression, like from gigabit to, I don't know, 800 MB or something like this. And to avoid this kind of speed regression, we need this TX timer, which will keep some time uh, the link in high power mode. And I added here some extra information. Um, here, if TX timer is not configured correctly, then you'll have a speed regression. And if VEC timer is not configured correctly, you'll have uh, frame corruptions. Yeah, this is the same information. Um, how to see it on the RGMII side. So uh, the picture before it was the cable side. The, the RGMII side, or there are different MII variants, uh, whatever you are using, uh, they will signal the low power idle in some special way. There is defined opcodes. You can, you will be able to find this uh, in. Uh, some of IEEE uh, slides. This is not always uh, directly available. Um, here's the case for RGMII. It is very easy to see if you attach your scope to TX control line. This one. If you see this button, it is uh, low power idle. So you're able to use like not too much of scope lines, uh, one to uh, TX control line and other to actual cable to see what is happening. And if you measure this, you'll find some interesting issues like I found in uh, for some Months uh, and uh, IMX8 MP. There is a, a very popular uh, evaluation board which is with uh, Realtek Phi, and everything is fine. But as, as as soon as I started testing it, I found that this Phi is actually in uh, energy efficient Phi mode. It is not using Mac to provide energy efficient Ethernet at all. And what Mac is doing and what kind of configuration is using don't reflect anything on this uh, configuration. So any changes of in timers and so on will not change anything in this case. Um, 
and this is one of problems <laughs> because in case of this file, it is actually was not publicly documented that this mode is supported. And it was really nasty because uh, if you use uh, this uh, board with PTP, pop, pop, uh, Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Precision time protocol. You will see uh, like uh, really heavy jitter and uh, um, things which you not should have for precision time protocol. And it is possible to switch this file in actually f Mac mode. So the Mac is regulating file and telling that we are using cloud now the uh, low power idle or not. Uh, but this is not publicly, publicly documented and you need to get an NDA to switch these modes and I failed in this case. In, ca in case some of you has uh, NDA assigned with uh, real tech, just please maybe you can get it, <laughs> this information, fix this file. And what is interesting about, about this file, if you switch it in 10 megabit mode, um, well, this file has integrated buffer well, to be able to support this phi-based energy efficient mode. And this power buffer is so huge that it will introduce delay of like 900 microseconds. Yeah, exactly. 900 microseconds. It's like, poof. but it's only in 10 bit mode. Uh, so, a bit tips for hacking, yeah, just uh, not so high power, power uh, budget uh, scope. Um, two channels is usually enough. Actually, you should use a differential probe. It is safe, I recommend it. Don't do this except you are knowing what you're doing. And don't do this if you have power over ethernet attached. Otherwise, probably your scope will blow out. Um, well, with this kind of setup, I just um, walked around of uh, my missing uh, differential probes, which are usually expensive. Uh, in this case, you'll be able to measure differential signal. Uh, I use this kind of uh, boards. Uh, our company producing this. If you need this, uh, contact me or uh, directly Linux Automation Game or this. There is a link. Uh, it's just nice for hacking uh, everything Ethernet related. Um, if you see, well, uh, to, to make measurements and get expected results, you should disable automatic uh, crossover detection, which will make sure that you will see um, transmit and receive site separately in case of 10 and 100 Mbit. Uh, in case not, you'll be always like mixed, uh, you'll get always mixed results, like transmit on one side, receive on other side, and by other link change, it will be other way around. Uh, the problem is that sometimes driver are broken and do not configure this correctly, so the other drivers should be fixed as well. Uh, and in this case, on this picture, you are seeing auto negotiation pulses. And in this case, auto crossover is enabled, so you'll see auto neck pulses like switching between different cables. If it's working correctly, you'll see this picture. There is no jumping between auto neck pulses on different cables. Um, other part of investigation, what is going wrong with uh, energy efficient internet is to use ETH tool just to show uh, what is announced on your side, what is received from other side, uh, an auto negotiation uh, level. And as soon as you see that uh, energy efficient internet is actually active and working, you will see this kind of picture. So these are. Uh, actual refresh pulses and everything other is uh, the silent part of uh, the picture. And if there is no auto negotiation is active or actual uh, frame is transferred, then you will see uh, a lot of modulated signal. 
So just one more comparison. One is A is active, other is A is not active. And in case of 10 megabit uh, configuration, uh, I mean 100 bit configuration, uh, you is able to use partial energy efficient configuration, like one side is in low power idle, like this one. So this one is low power idle active, and the other one is low power idle is not active. Um, yeah. And uh, if you see a uh, frame transferred, then you'll see something like this. Low power idle active, frame not active. And here in this case, it is very important to measure actual time and compare it with uh, ETH tool TX timer configuration. This, this one. If these are numbers which are correctly configured and clocks are correctly trans uh, calculated, then you'll get proper uh, numbers. In case of gigabit, uh, then actual, uh, in gigabit case, uh, there are no transfer and receive lines on all four twisted cables. Uh, you have part of uh, modulated signal, uh, so you will not be able to differentiate between one side receiving other side receiving, so you should keep other side silent to be able to debug everything what you need. Yeah, I hope it was fast enough. <laughs> Do you have questions? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, also for us uh, EE is a constant source of problems. Um, our customers plug all different devices into uh, a Fritz box. We make the Fritz box, okay. and for us it's sometimes difficult to tell uh, whether it's the customer's device that does it wrong, or if if we do it wrong, mm -hmm. or if the uh, vendor uh, chip or driver does it wrong. We yeah. we have. Um, Pies and Max from all the vendors you mentioned, and yeah, do you have a um, strategy or a recommendation how how we uh, approach this? Um, how to find out basically if, if, if we are on the good side and mm. it, it must be the customer's device or, or maybe there's some confirmation test or test uh, a good good other side that we can test against or, or, or something like that. Um, there are some. Counters integrated device which uh, like uh, counts uh, failed attempts to vec uh, the link. Maybe this can be used, but currently I don't have enough uh, experience to remotely diagnose this kind of problems. Currently, only local <laughs> experience. So I don't have any practical advice right now. But we can discuss this, I don't know, maybe after Thank session. You. So did you document uh, this, uh, your findings somewhere that uh, people can find and perhaps put input their findings? Um, currently there's only this uh, <laughs> presentation <laughs> which is linked on the LPC event site. So and uh, some discussions on the net uh, dev mailing list with Andrew and uh, So you'd mentioned <clears throat> for the, the TX wake up that there has to be some coordination with the remote Fi and the remote Mac um, to avoid frame corruption. Hmm. What, what sort of resolution in terms of time sync do you need for that? Is it I'm assuming there's a there's a PTP or a PTM component that you'd need to run to sync, or is mm. it you just no. hope, hope the clocks run at the same? For the wake time, uh, there is no need to uh, there is no need for synchronization between um, sites, but uh, there is uh, um, definition in the IEEE standard what kind time f times are actually expected, and if systems are outside of these times, then things will break. Um, 
and so, so did you mean more of like if if the remote side gets a pulse then it has to respond within a certain time yes oh, okay okay thank you but but these times are different and currently a kernel do not they have no idea about these times timings uh, so potentially a next part which should be done inside of the phi framework is to list all of these timings they are different between link speeds and uh, use them as standard for Mac drivers. So, so basically apply offsets to yeah. the known vendors having variants. Hmm. Thank you. All right, I think th this is all the time we have for the questions. So thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> uh, a little gift for you from LPC. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Look. Give people two minutes to shuffle out and in. Okay. All right, next talk is by Maxim about uh, representing front facing parts. <laughs> Good luck. I can start? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, welcome to this talk. Uh, I am going to continue talking about five topics and low level aspects of the link. Um, so, um, I am Maxim, so I, I work at Bootlin, and what we do is embedded uh, systems development. So, on my side, I've been working on embedded devices for a good chunk of the past seven years uh, and focusing on the network aspects of it. Uh, and so, uh, what I'm going to talk about is how do we deal with devices uh, that has network interfaces, uh, but when you look at the physical device, there are more than one front-facing front port that is attached to that, uh, to that net device. Um, so before I dive into it, just a, a small refresher for everyone. Uh, on typical embedded systems, uh, you have something that looks more or less like that. You have a system on a chip. Within that SOC, you have a Mac uh, controller. And that Mac controller is going to be connected usually to a PHY, and that PHY connected to a front-facing port. So the need for the PHY is to do some kind of translation of the pretty generic protocol that is output by the Mac and the medium-specific protocol that needs to be sent uh, on the actual link. So the actual physical protocol depends on whether you are using fiber, uh, you are using uh, typical copper ethernet or single pair ethernet or BNC or whatever. There are tons and tons of, of different uh, protocols that you can use. And uh, this, this picture here, it's a good representation of 90% uh, of the systems. And what I want to talk about is the rest of that. So uh, the file, for example, is not always there. Sometimes there is no file at all on the link. The Mac is directly connected to the uh, front facing port because the file is either within the Mac or we use SFP, for example, which uses a, a serialized link uh, that can be directly output by the Mac. Um, sometimes the file is not handled by the kernel itself. It's driven by a firmware running on the NIC. Uh, sometimes there is no port at all. We are using backplane Ethernet. Uh, so we, it's hard to make assumptions uh, about the fact that this is going to be the de facto uh, design for a network interface on an embedded system. So what I want to talk about is this kind of situation. Uh, so you have a Mac, something on the hardware uh, is going to uh, actually split that single output from the Mac into two front-facing ports. So the, the cloud here is the, where the magic happens. This is what cloud computing looks like on embedded systems. Um, so we have several examples of uh, devices supported upstream that have this kind of layout. The two main reasons for that is either to give the final user a choice uh, on the connector. For example, having both an SFP cage and an RG45 connector. Uh, we have devices upstream like the Macchiato bin that has that design, but there are also switches that have this uh, kind of design, uh, say an eight port switch that has actually 12 front facing ports for our SFP cages that are shared with other ports of the switch. Um, and the other uh, reason to use that is to achieve some kind of redundancy on the link. Uh, so it's a bit different than uh, bonding or uh, any kind of other technology that does redundancy. Here we have redundancy of the link at the layer one. So we basically 
when we are going to use only one link at a time. Of course, there is no other way. This is not a switch, the, the cloud here. Uh, we can only use one single port at any given time. Uh, and if the link goes down on the port we are using, we can try to see if there is link on the other one. Um, and again, there are devices out there that have this kind of, uh, of thing implemented. Um, so we are going to focus on the connector part, uh, the port here. Um, so we know actually a lot and not that much about that port here uh, in the kernel. So what I mean is that um, we know very well uh, when the link is established, uh, what we can do on that link. Uh, for example, when you are connected to your link partner, you can know very precisely if you can do um, 10 megabits per second, 100, 1 gig, 10 gigs in half duplex, in full duplex, do you have flow control available to you or not? All of that is very well known when the link is established, uh, but you don't know actually that much about the physical connector and the limitations that are imposed uh, to the link because of the physical port. Uh, an example would be, for example, if your PHY is connected to your RG45 port with only two um, pairs of wires instead of four, then you will be limited to 100 meg megabits per second. You cannot do 10, uh, one gig in that uh, configuration. So um, the PHY device and the PHY subsystem give us uh, some clues about that. Uh, we have a field that is the PHY dev port, which tells us if we are using twisted pair or fiber or BNC, very, very generic information. Uh, and we have kind of a list of the different supported ports in terms of fiber or twisted pair, but very broad terms that we can use. And as I said, we have also the East tool case settings that give us precise information about the link when it is established. Um, when you use SFP, we have also the advantage that the SFP module uh, can tell us what they can do, uh, if they are fiber or if they are copper. Uh, there are some, again, some, uh, some quirks with that, but we can uh, derive a lot uh, about what we can do based on whatever the SFP module reports to us. Um, and um, yeah, we know that information when we have link uh, right now. Um, so what I would try to come up with is an internal representation in the kernel of the physical connector. Uh, one thing I don't know how to do well is naming stuff. I'm really bad at naming. The name I have came up with so far is PhyPort, but I don't really like it. Port in the networking world means a lot of things already. Uh, we talk about switch port, interfaces, and so on. Uh, so maybe MDI would be a more appropriate term. Uh, MDI is what the standard uh, uses to refer what comes out of the Phi towards the outside world. Uh, so maybe that would be a, a, an appropriate name. Um, and within that uh, object, we will have a set of dedicated callback operations uh, that will allow us to know whatever we can do on a physical connector. Um, so the goal is to keep that very transparent. Most of the devices that are out there, uh, they just have one single front-facing port for each interface. So the, the information we would report would just be whatever the FI reports or the MAC reports. But on multi-port systems, uh, we would have different information reported for each port. Um, but yeah, again, the goal is to make that very transparent. Um, so we know quite a lot of things right now. Uh, how do we know, as of today, what we can do on a physical interface? Uh, so if we look at a, an embedded system, for example, uh, with a Phi and a Mac and one single port, how do we know what we can do on that port? Um, well, the first clue is the Phi we are using. Um, the Phi device might only know how to do one single thing. Um, for example, if it's a base T1 Phi for single pair Ethernet, there is a good chance that that Phi knows only uh, one protocol, base T1S, base T1L, and so on. So we have no choice but to use uh, these uh, protocols on that link. Um, but on some other cases, we can use devices or NICs that can be configured in a different variety of ways. So for example, uh, a file that can do uh, typical copper ethernet or that can be connected to an SFP cage uh, alternatively. Uh, and the way you would select that is based on usually hardware straps. So on the PCB, uh, with the way the file is integrated, there are some straps that are going to connect some pads to ground or to VCC in order to auto configure the file in a given mode and basically hard code that. Um, sometimes the straps are wrong uh, and they report uh, 
things that are not correct, or they, are, they were not integrated correctly in the PCB, uh, or they are glitchy. Uh, so how do we do in that case? Uh, and in other cases, and this is more for NICs that are uh, fully uh, self-contained, like PCI NICs and so on, uh, this kind of information would be in some kind of an EEPROM or uh, reported by a firmware running on the NIC, uh, telling you, okay, the, this particular instance of that NIC has two SFP ports, or it has just one uh, RG45 connector. And the final information is looking at device tree. Uh, in device tree, we have a few clues about the actual physical medium we are using, but it's not ideal, I would say. Um, in the case of files that can do either fiber or copper, we have some cases where this information needs to be set in device tree because the straps are incorrect. And what we start to see is a tendency towards having uh, vendor-specific properties uh, that are being used. For example, we have a fiber mode property uh, that is uh, used by TI uh, files and also uh, on micro files, different properties from uh, different vendors, but it, they do exactly the same thing. Uh, we have the operation mode for TI files. So all of that is just configuring the file uh, in a way that will make it output the right protocol uh, on its MDI bus. Um, so if we come up with a way to also better represent the front-facing ports in device tree, this will also help us build that uh, set of capabilities that each front-facing port can export to the world. And one thing we are uh, clearly lacking right now is information about the absence of a port. So let me show you an example. Um, and this is like a real life example. We have a device that has this exact uh, configuration. Um, the first uh, representation at the very top is how do you represent in device tree a uh, phi, uh, simple phi device. Uh, so you have a node in device tree that represents your phi device. And then you have uh, some pointers, some p handles in your Mac node that points to that phi. So the first case is a phi with a copper, uh, a copper connector. The second case is a phi that has an SFP after it, because the phi in that case is used as a media converter. So it converts whatever the Mac outputs into something that you can feed into an SFP cage. And in that case, the device tree is a bit different. You have a p-handle that contains a reference to the SFP uh, cage. And the third case is a device that uh, has a phi which exports both an RG45 port and an SFP connector. And as you can see in device tree, you have absolutely no difference uh, between that case and the second one. You don't know if there is an RG45 connector or not. You have to guess it or infer its presence. Uh, so how do we know about uh, this information here? Um, so, so far we don't, uh, and it's a happy accident that all of the devices that we have that use the files that have this kind of capabilities have both port wires, uh, but we should try to come up with a, a new way to represent that uh, to avoid the ambiguities. Um, so that's the second point of my talk. The first one is about that port internal representation. Are we missing stuff? Do we, need, do we actually need that representation or not? The second point is about device tree. Uh, so this is a work in progress example of what it could look like. Um, so the main idea is inside your phi node, you would have an MDI uh, node that would list all of the ports. And among the information you would set is the kind of technologies each port would uh, be able to support. Uh, in the first case, it's going to be uh, based Ethernet at 10, 100, and 1,000 megabits per second. The number of lanes that are wired, um, so in terms of uh, you know the differential pairs that go between the phi and the actual connector. And uh, another nice thing, and maybe this is something we could discuss uh, with people that do a bit of PoE, uh, is um, we could use that to better represent devices that are uh, power over Ethernet providers. Like uh, when you are using PoE on a device uh, as a PoE provider, um, you typically use a dedicated controller that will inject the power, and this controller is going to sit between the phi and the connector. So uh, we could consider using that node in device tree to actually attach the information about the fact that a, a PoE controller is going to inject power on that port specifically. And in this example, there is also an SFP cage attached to the same phi. So no binding was accepted or submitted yet. This is still work in progress, so feel free to, to comment if you have some, uh, some ideas on that. And the last part that I want to talk about in that whole problem um, is how do we deal with switch switching sorry, between uh, the ports uh, at runtime? So say you have one interface, two ports, 
we can only use one at a time. Um, how do we deal with that? Um, so here I have like removed the magic cloud and I show you some actual physical uh, configuration that exists on products. So we have uh, on the far right side, the use case I've been mentioning you, one single file that drives two ports. On the middle, there is another use case that we have, which is a device that has one Mac and two files connected to the same Mac. Um, so this is something I have been working on in the past months, and the support for that is starting to, uh, uh, to be accepted upstream. Uh, it's not totally there yet, but we are getting there. Uh, and if you look at the difference between these two cases, or even these three cases, the third one is same with two files, but one is within the SOC and the other one is external. Uh, what the user will actually care about is not really the internal topology of the link, the internal hardware integration, but the fact that he has one interface and two front-facing ports. So we need to give the user some way to control uh, all of that. Like, I want to use that one or I want to use that one, but maybe we can go a bit further than that and say, I want to prefer the port number one over the port number two because the port number one is the one that I'm going to want to use most of the time and the second one is a backup. Or go even further than that and say, if I am able to detect the link on both parts at the same side, still use one for data transfer, but do the negotiation on the other one, maybe what I want to do is use the one that has negotiated the fastest speed uh, and automatically switch uh, the port to the one that has the fastest speed. So uh, doing that uh, is possible, uh, but the thing is uh, we have some limitations uh, depending on how the hardware is done on how we can perform link detection on the ports that are not currently used. Um, so I've listed basically three main cases that I have encountered. Uh, the first case is the best case scenario. Uh, when you are using one port physically, you can still perform link detection on the other one, uh, no matter what. You can negotiate the, the link speed and so on. Of course, you cannot send and receive data on it. Uh, it's, both ports are exclusive, but you can detect link on that one. So you could consider uh, switching uh, the ports with the one that has the highest speed. The second case is when you are using one port, you cannot do anything on the other one, not perform link detection and so on. And the third case is a bit worse than that is even when there is no link on any port, uh, you can only detect the link on one port at a time. So you do a round robin to detect the link. So you check for two seconds if there is link on port number one, then you stop, and then you check for two seconds if there is link on port number two, and then you stop and you do a run robin like that to do the link detection. Um, and when we do the port switching, uh, we also have to consider the case where the two ports are connected to the same switch. So we need to send uh, some kind of data to the switch to make it update uh, its internal forwarding database uh, through a great u IRP. And when we start looking at that, it starts to look a little bit more like bonding. Uh, so um, this is another question, open question, like would it be possible to integrate that with the bonding subsystem or not? It's similar but different, like we have only one net device here in that case. Um, so all of that are the open questions. Um, so the, the user space API I have so far um, is not yet submitted, but it will uh, come shortly after that talk, is based on uh, Ethernet Netlink, so it's very specific to Ethernet, uh, and it's just a way to list the front-facing ports and set a few attributes on them to uh, force one port uh, to be used, or set one as preferred, or disable one port entirely. So it's a very basic API, uh, and it's also open for discussion if you have uh, ideas on that. Um, so that was my main, uh, the, the main goal of that talk, to present what I've been working on so far, if you have ideas. Uh, the code so far, I have prototype code for uh, pretty much everything I have presented. Uh, I will send parts of it as an RFC uh, after the talk, uh, but yeah, the, I, I have started to like troubleshoot most of the issues, uh, but only with my limited set of uh, boards available and use cases in mind. Uh, so if you have other things that you uh, have considered when looking at that, uh, let me know. Uh, some next thing that we um, that we will do in terms of upstreaming uh, is um, also the support for the fire isolation. You know that 
uh, that use case where we have two files connected to the same Mac. We have to make sure that one is not going to interfere with another. So this has been partially, well, this has been submitted, uh, but uh, it's not yet upstream. Uh, but yeah, the next step is going to submit the, the whole thing that I've been presenting to you. Uh, all right, so I think that's it for me. Uh, now I will take some questions. I think we have time for some. So have you considered any options or um, other ways to do the device tree binding on systems that don't have device tree? That's a good question. Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> do you have such a use case uh, on some hardware? After seeing what you've been showing with two different phi or two different connectivity things with like an RJ45 with a redundant SAP, it definitely gets some ideas floating um, for options that might be interesting for, for our use cases. So having some kind of kernel interface that would be more of like in an x86 land would be compelling. So something along the lines of ACPI? Or yeah, like an ACPI based thing. But yeah, how would that be described would be kind I, of interesting to dig into the details. I guess the main attributes would be very similar. Uh, but then I am not versed uh, that much into ACPI myself. So uh, if or any help would be welcome. Okay, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'll, I'll be watching for it because I'm, I'm very interested now. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? There we go. Hello, yeah. Uh, just an answer partially to your comment. Uh, I have a USB Ethernet adapter with two interfaces. I mean, with two integrated files, so it's... Uh, will not be possible to address it with ICPI anyway. So it's maybe will be detected by chip ID or by, by vendor ID and you'll need some extra code to describe it or I have no yeah. idea how to solve and it. Another thing is that the, uh, we already have like tons of devices out there with already that setup. So the device tree would only be to <laughs> clarify some things but uh, you can also have the option of registering the ports without device tree at all. If, for example, the Fi or the NIC or the Mac can already know everything there is to know about these ports, can also instantiate these objects and, and re register them. Do you want to register them as a separate interface or you want to create the software nodes or whatever that thing is? Good question. <laughs> I have a basic question. So um, you showed the example where there's one Fi and two ports. Yep. Um, that kind of gets tricky about like what attributes are really about the port and what attributes belong to the file, right? Like, I don't. Do you yeah. have any ideas on that? Yeah, well, that's the whole complexity uh, of it. Uh, so, what we get for information as information right now, if if nothing is connected, the the file will report everything it can do in its entirety, like an aggregation of what both ports can do, and so the complexity would be to in the file drivers that support that split that out between the two ports and uh, say this one can only do base T and this one can only do base X uh, or base R. But then when you plug an SFP module, this is going to change depending on what the SFP is going to do. Uh, so this is where most of the complexity will lie uh, here. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Let Thank me you. give you the chocolates. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.